Hey YouTube, Gabe here with another uh, ban list video, because while I haven't made one yet, you've probably seen all of the other people in the community talking about it. So because of that, I'm not really going to go into too much detail about the ban list that we got itself, because I'm just going under the assumption that you all already know what happened, so I don't want to waste your all time. So instead of talking about the list itself, what I'm going to be talking about is the winners and the losers of the ban list. So obviously this ban list impacts the meta. It's probably the biggest single list we've received in Vanguard history. It actually is a ban list first in that this is the first time we in Vanguard have ever been disallowed from playing a card at all. We've had grade zeros be forbidden for use as starters. We've had cards be forbidden with, like, as an example, we have, like, TikTok Worker or the 7C starter back in G era as well. Um, we've had cards that were banned in specific decks. Like, you couldn't play the Je uh, Jewel Knight grade 2 unless all of your grade 3s were Jewel Knights, so you couldn't play it with Sanctuary Guard. But we've never had a card outright be unallowed from being able to be played, which we got not one, but two of, which were um, the new Ichikashima and the Bermuda Triangle G-Guard Alley. So uh, going on to the winners and the losers of the ban list, the winners were pretty obvious. It's uh, everybody that escaped the ban list because it meant that... Uh, they could still play their decks as optimum as possible. The what, but I'm gonna obviously talk about like some of the ones in particular. People were at, thinking that, um, or asking in some cases that Luard and Katrina for Neos and Shadows should be hit because they're very powerful decks. They've been some of the strongest decks in the format since the um premium collection first came out they've been doing pretty well lured has been one of the top three decks of all time alongside golds and bermudas and unlike gold and bermudas Luard walked away without a hit and uh, katrina walked away without a hit either so part of why i think they escaped the ban list altogether is in the case of Luard, unlike golds and bermudas shadows while it was a very powerful deck, is not as unhealthy for the game as Bermuda's and Gold's were. Bermuda has been good since the end of G and was topping tournaments pretty consistently even before they received V triggers in the primary melody when they first got they got their first wave of support. And the fact that they were able to top tournaments in premium without V series triggers just kind of shows how and after uh, the Stan Crook got hit kind of just shows how dominant the deck was and how it really needed to get checked. And um, similarly to that, we had Golds with Ezel, which, while it hadn't been topping as long as Bermuda's, it's been topping consistently since we got um, the Ultra Rare Booster. And on top of that... It took up three of the top eight slots at Worlds, one of which going to second place. So while it hadn't been topping for as long as Bermuda's, it was topping just as, if not somewhat more frequently, while also kind of ignoring a basic mechanic of the game being riding, because you can both skip riding and you can start striding earlier because of Spear X. So, uh, and while Luard, in terms of... Uh, percentage and representation in tournaments has been seeing pretty similar to those two because it hasn't been doing it for as long as those two and because what it does isn't as broken as those two because of how those two have functioned luar didn't need to escape didn't really need to get checked so while it was a very strong deck it wasn't as oppressive or as unfair so it definitely I think it makes sense that Luard didn't get touched, and obviously Luard's going to be one of the best decks. And go on to Katrina, um, kind of similar to uh, Luard, it, Neos did literally nothing in premium uh, prior to the premium collection. It barely did anything in G throughout G, so 
kind of Katrina is really what the deck needed to do anything in the meta game at all. But on top of that, it Neos is in a very weird uh, position because it it's kind of hard to hit it in a meaningful way without outright killing the deck. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say you put Katrina to two. It really doesn't change anything because you never really go into two more than two at all. I think I might have gone into three like tw two or three times since the set came out. You hit, I don't know, Sylvia in the main deck to make tokens. You still have Made of Trailing Rose. You have Exploding Tomato. You have Murka. You got Fruit Basket. So you can't hit you can't hit Katrina, and so back on Katrina, you can't reduce Katrina to two because it won't do anything to the deck at all. But on the other hand, you can't reduce it to more than two because then the deck kind of crumbles. Well, you can definitely win games first run with Katrina consistently. Putting it at one it definitely puts the deck in a very dangerous position where if you don't kill that first stride you're probably not going to do much. You kind of just hope the momentum you get from your first stride Katrina is enough to carry you over so that you don't, that you'll still win the game. Uh, back in the main deck, if you just hit Sylvia or you just hit Murka, you still have Tomato, Trailing Rose, and Fruit Basket Elf to make tokens. Or if you pick any two of the five, you still have, if you hit two, uh, one or two of the main deck cards that make tokens, you still have the others because there are five different main deck cards that make tokens. So, it like hitting one or two won't really do much. But on the other side, if you hit three or four of them and you only have one, even if you have multiple Katrinas, Katrina first stride isn't really going to do anything. So you have to hit either so you kind of have to hit a lot of them, or you have to hit really and hope that like the deck can somehow do anything, even though it won't. Or hit nothing and just kind of hope power creep can overtake it. The only way I can really see the deck being hit in a substantial way is reducing the amount of copies of Trailing Rose. Because Trailing Rose is the only card that can generate tokens without... That can generate with tokens without a cost, barring Sylvia. But uh, Trailing Rose can also generate two. As well, it does this on ride, so you can get a gift, you can get your two tokens, and then immediately go into Katrina. Let's say you don't see Merker or Sylvia for the ride, if you can ride Trailing Rose and then stride Katrina, you already have three cards, to like three tokens, that can hit for 15k and have Katrina turn into other cards. So Trailing Rose is the best hit to the deck without outright killing it, and that would probably have to be put it at like one or two. But at the same time, while it is one of the better decks in the format, it isn't so oppressive in terms of representation that it needs to be hit. Um, the top three consistently were decks like Bermuda's, Golds, and Shadows. Below that was Kagero, Nubatama, um, OT, and was Kagero and the Nubatama OTT. Neos and Aqua Force kind of in like the same area. And I, yeah, so the deck has been doing, it's been doing well. It's a solid tier two deck. But I'm of the opinion that unlike Yu Gi Oh!, where they have consistent ban lists because they don't have any form of rotation or other formats, where the reboot was basically glorified um, rotation and um, we have premium and standard. Yu-Gi-Oh! uses banlist as its form of rotation. So they kind of need banlist to alter the format. In Vanguard, we rarely have banlist because we were rarely in a position where we need them. Decks, I'm of the opinion that decks shouldn't be hit unless they are a problem. And problem can also mean outside of representation. If you look at a pie chart, like, just holistically, just that one pie chart in isolation, and the deck has, say, 14-15% representation, you can acknowledge that it is definitely one of, if not the stronger decks in that format. Like, that's about as often as Golds, Shadows, and uh, Bermudas were represented. 
But the thing is, is that you have to look at it outside of that. Golds and Bermudas had had that representation for over half a year. In the case of Bermuda, while, and while it hadn't been that full 15%, it had had decent representation for over a year and a half at this point. They aren't hit because of how how represented they were. They were hit because of how long they have had that representation and because of how oppressive they are. So, and that's also the reason why I don't think that Luard and Neo should have been hit. Because while they are strong decks, no question, they haven't been strong long enough to feel as oppressive as decks as Golds and um, Bermudas could be. And... On the flip side, it, could, it should also be banned if it, while not re counting representation, kind of creates an unhealthy interaction. And in that case, I'm going to take a brief pause from the winners to go to the losers with Nubatama as a loser. Because Nubatama is one of the stronger decks. However, it only had the, about the same as much representation as decks like Neonectar. The thing is, it was hit where Luar, whereas Luard was not. Because the interaction between Jamyo Kongo and Shiranui Rene was not a healthy interaction. Yes, it wasn't the most oppressive deck in the format, but nobody wants to play a matchup where it's ride Jamyo Kongo, reduce hand to six, stride Rene, reduce hand to two, reduce hand to four on first stride, and then the next turn, re ride Jamyo, reduce hand to four, and then Rene and reduce hand to two, and then have dominate with crits. Whether or not that deck was as powerful as Golds, Bermudas, or Shadows, it, that interaction is not a design that should have actually gone into place, which is why that deck got hit, even though it wasn't the most represented at all. So, going back into the winner's bracket, um, despite I've been saying things about the deck prior, um, in, for the past 12 minutes, um, a deck that I would count as a winner is, honestly, Gold Paladin. The thing is, is that, yes, Criff got hit. And Old Criff is definitely a better starter for the deck than New Criff. Because Old Criff basically is the same as New Criff, but you don't need to have Ezel in your hand. And you also get Twin Drive if you don't stride that turn. The thing is, based off of Gold's representation, especially when compared to Bermuda's, Losing Criff as the starter, especially when there is another Criff to replace it, does do no nowhere near as much damage to the deck as losing Ange and Ellie. As well, this that hit was really just a slap on the wrist because that's all the deck lost. Yes, it so it really just lost consistently consistency, but it didn't lose that much consistency. Because think about every time you have played a game in Standard. Think about every time against Gold in Standard. Think about every game against Gold you played where in that in Standard, the Gold player is able to superior ride Ezel with Bowmane and already having Ezel in hand. That's just going to happen in Premium now. And yes, it sucks that they need to have both Bowmane and Ezel, but because New Criff draws a card whereas the old one didn't, it's a slight piece of consistency to help where it already lost them. Yes, it's they lost more consistency than they gained, but they did gain some because of that. And on, on top of all of that, because they don't, because old Criff stays in the soul, they don't need to risk losing old, um, old because new Criff stays in the soul, because they don't need to risk losing old Criff to cards like Blaster Dark or Kagura or anything. So, yes, they lost the consistency. But they gained protection against decks that could retire in the early game where they wouldn't be able to um, skip stride into. So, and because they only lost Criff, the deck does exactly what it did before as it can do. The deck will do now exactly what it could still do before. The only difference is it will, only, it will do it slightly less because all they lost was the consistency with Criff. They can still do Bowmane call Gareth, and if they got Ezel and Soul, you're still going to be on the exact same receiving end. Um, end. Maybe slightly better if they can't superior stride because Ezel will only have one drive check. 
But that one drive, but be honest with yourselves, all the games you played against Premium Azul, was that one drive check on a twin drive Azul the thing that was really what would cause you to lose? No. So, because the deck did lost absolutely zero power and it only lost a modicum of consistency, I still would count the deck as a winner and would be one of, it will still definitely be one of the top three decks of the format. Um, so we talked about golds, neos, shadows as winners, everybody that didn't get touched as winners. Um, yeah, okay. So now moving on to the losers is everybody that was on the list that uh, did get hit. So first off is Bermudas. The deck has been gone for, the deck has been so good for so long it needed to get hit. Uh, losing Ellie was definitely a good call for the deck because Ellie was such a powerful card. Flipping itself face down while also getting massive amounts of shield definitely um, is going to hurt the deck. Losing Ange um, to one really hurts the deck's A consistency, but, Z, uh, but B power. As well, part, I think part of why Neos wasn't topping as much is because um, Ange kind of acted as a slight check to it. Because if Ange bounced a plant token, it's effectively like it was retired because it can't exist in the hand. And yeah, that isn't the biggest detriment to Neos because there's so many ways to do it. But the fact that they still had to deal with that was still kind of a hurt to it. So now that Ange is down to one, it really is going to um, help Neos in that way. But also it really hurt Bermudas. But at the same time... Because the Lisa Letts and Caro or whatever, I don't know, I don't play standard, I don't know the name of the primary melody stuff. Um, because that um choice restriction didn't happen in premium, it kind of will just make the deck segue into premium plus where they just slap a G zone on a standard deck. So while I think that the deck is definitely hurt and it's definitely gonna see a, a pretty steep loss in representation, because they don't have to deal with the choice restriction the deck will still be able to do some of the things it was able to do before. So while it definitely got hurt, I don't think this is quite the end of Bermudas, but I could obviously be wrong because I barely played Bermudas in premium and I played against them in standard once. So, yeah, but it's overall, I would definitely count Bermudas as a loser. Uh, next is, I already talked about Nubatama, so I don't really feel the need to go into that now. Next is OTT, because Ichikashima and the starter got hits. Ichikashima is gone, and the old starter can't be used as the starter. So, I feel like maybe I'm biased because I play OTT, but I'm probably not because I really don't care. <laughs> but I think Ichi to zero was too harsh of a hit for OTT. Yes, it was a, um, a very rough hit to the deck i don't think the deck is so was so oppressive that it needed it to go to zero the deck had a, the same representation as neos thereabouts and yeah neos didn't get hit at all i think ichi could have gotten hit but i think putting it to zero was too harsh and the deck is pretty much gonna die at this point if they made it a choice restriction between old Ichi and new Ichi or new Ichi or new Ichi and like Tom or something, then I think it would have been much more um, understandable and satisfactory. But putting Ichi to zero is too much for the deck because now the deck is going to be too slow because their best first stride kind of went back to old Ichi. So their best first stride is counter blast one, soul blast one, flip something, draw two which is not fast enough in premium. So I think it was too rough. So that's why I would argue that it was the biggest loser in the list. Whereas Jamio Congo and Rene, yes, it was really harsh, but the fact that you can still use Jamio Congo with other G units or Rene with other main deck cards, like that one card from the first new Batama set, that was like a bounce your opponent's field and then make them discard. There are still options that Nubatama has for play that can probably help them persevere through the list. Whereas OTT is literally just back to where it was before premium collection because they lost their premium collection card. And Nubatama doesn't, they don't care because they didn't really use their premium collection card. 
So, yeah, if um, I were to hazard a guess for what the meta would look like now, I would probably say that the top three decks in the format are looking like Neos, Golds, and Shadow, because of all the decks on the... And um, probably... Actually, mm, maybe replace one of them for with Kagero, because back on the winner's thing, Kagero, Blade Master Loop didn't get touched at all. So I would probably say that those are the best decks, and those four are the best decks in the format right now. And I think that OTT at this point is pretty much dead, and that um, Bermuda's is on the decline, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, and in the same way Nubatama, were still able to do something, because they definitely lost power, but I think what with their support, they'll be able to figure out a way to um, get through this. Bermuda's much more so than Nubatama. But I wouldn't be surprised if either of them, especially if Bermuda's didn't make it, if uh, they were able to make it through and still be able to uh, compete on in the meta game. Uh, that was 20 minutes of me talking. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and see you next time.